Hello, and um, welcome to this training session brought to you by the Society of American Archivists, Archivists of Religious Collection Selection. My name is Sarah Waits, and um, I want to go ahead and read our land acknowledgement here on the screen. We acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional lands of many indigenous nations. We know that indigenous peoples have suffered from historical and ongoing injustices and understand as an archival organization that means we must work toward sharing historical truths and renew respectful relationships with indigenous communities. We respect the longstanding relationships that indigenous nations have to this land as the original caretakers. We are grateful for their stewardship and protection of the water and earth. We pay our respects to elders past and present. The content in these presentations is for information only and is not legal advice. Our views do not represent the organizations where we work. We do not make any endorsements or guarantees. We are not liable for any loss or damage caused by your use of the content we provide. It is your responsibility to critically evaluate the content provided in the presentation or any accompanying materials. You will not be able to use your microphone or video during this session. You can click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen and under Live transcript, click Enable Auto Transcription to get closed captioning. There will be a question period after the presentation concludes. You should use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. We will not answer questions in the chat or unmute attendees due to time constraints. Please be respectful in your interactions. We expect you to follow the SAA Code of Conduct, which is available on the SAA website. This session will be recorded Please fill out the short survey after the session ends, and we encourage you to join the Society of American Archivists if you are not already a member. We thank the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph in Canada for hosting this webinar. All right, so um, I would like to introduce our presenters, Dr. Emily Loomis and Eric Fair. So I have your guys' bio that was included in the um, information about the chat. So Emily Gagne Loomis, PhD, is a certified archivist, certified records manager, and fellow of the Society of American Archivists. With more than 25 years of experience in the field of archives and records management, Dr. Loomis currently teaches at Louisiana State University and has her own archives and records management consulting business. Eric Fair is the director of archives and records for the Archdiocese of St. Louis in Missouri. He also serves as co-chair of the Forgive Us Our Trespasses Enslaved Persons Project of the Archdiocese and is one of the founders of Catholic Religious Organizations Studying Slavery, or CROSS. He served as president and treasurer of the Association of Catholic Diocesan Archivists. In the past, he has held positions in the King County Government Archives and the Archdiocese of Chicago, and served as an adjunct instructor at the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So I think um, if you guys are ready, uh, Dr. Loomis, I think you'll be starting the presentation. Yeah, everybody. hopefully everybody can hear me. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd first like to thank the ARCS Committee for inviting us here to speak with you today. Our objective today is twofold. First, to introduce you to CROSS, and then to discuss our work through research and case studies. My talk today is entitled Open Wide Our Archives, Truth, Access, and Transparency. I represent a group called CROSS, which is an acronym for Catholic Religious Organizations Studying Slavery. But who are we? Currently, we're a steering committee of 16, representing dioceses and religious organizations from men and women religious communities and higher education. We started meeting about two years ago to discuss the records of enslaved individuals held in our archives. But to be completely honest, this discussion has been ongoing for more than a decade at the Association of Catholic Diocesan Archivist meetings archivist raising subject matter and questions and about records of enslavement, um, archivists giving talk on the subject matter at historical associations, and religious organizations who have recognized what is in their archives 
and have begun to discuss their findings. Our mission is as follows. Recognizing that slavery is a sin, it is our mission to promote open and honest access to the historic record in order to achieve a more comprehensive and truth te truthful telling of enslavement within the Catholic Church in the United States. Our statement of purpose has four points. And while I'm go not going to read each one of these in detail, I would like to point out a few highlights. Members of CROSS want to work collectively to improve access to the records of the enslaved and to those who enslaved them. Secondly, many descendant communities have ancestors who were enslaved to more than one religious order, individual, or institution. Third, we find it prudent to assemble organizations and other entities who share a similar past to engage with descendant communities and to learn from one another. And lastly, we envision that in partnership with these other organizations, we can work to effect greater institutional response that addresses the legacies of slavery, benefit descendant communities, and eradicate racism within our respective institutions. In the title of this presentation are the words, truth, access, and transparency. And I'd like to examine each one of these separately. So what is the truth as we currently know it? Catholic bishops, priests, religious orders of men and women were slaveholders. Enslaved men and women worked in Catholic hospitals, Catholic schools, church parishes, and bishops' residences. Enslaved people built Catholic churches, cathedrals, hospitals, and schools. Hundreds of thousands of enslaved men, women, and children were baptized and given Christian names. For example, the Archdiocese of New Orleans has more than 100,000 names of people receiving the sacraments. In the Diocese of Baton Rouge, there are 40,000. In the Archdiocese of St. Louis, <coughs> excuse me, there are upwards of 100,000. Collectively, these three dioceses have a quarter of a million records of enslaved individuals receiving the sacraments. Often, each entry contains information for more than one person, as we'll see in a moment. The reality of the situation is there are more than, there are millions of documented enslaved people in the sacramental records in the dioceses across the United States. <coughs> Sorry, something caught in my throat. <clears> throat. And this is not just a Southern phenomenon. Some enslaved persons were confined and married in the church. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I'm so sorry. Baptisms, <clears throat> baptized enslaved persons were buried in Catholic cemeteries and some enslaved persons were allowed to join arch confraternities. Access to these historical records includes many things. Many dioceses keep these records closed. These are the reasons that I've heard in the last 20 to 30 years. These records are too hard to research because enslaved persons didn't have last names. The records denote race and legitimacy when we can't release that information. It makes the Catholic Church look bad. We don't know what's in the record. It makes us uncomfortable. We are worried what others might find. We only let scholars or those who write favorably research in the records. And I can tell you that in the past, I've been asked to provide a letter of good standing from my parish priest so that I could do research in a Catholic church's archives. And that is no longer the case, but it, it did happen. What about reparations? And we can't afford to do that. So those are some of the access issues that we've faced over these years. For transparency, um, I'd like to talk about um, one of our um, 
stewards in our project, and that's Archbishop Shelton Fobb. He has spoken eloquently about reconciliation in the church <clears throat> and what that means for those who suffer from racism and those whose ancestors were enslaved. <clears throat> I am really apologize. <clears throat> Eric, I may have to have you step in, do yours, and let me come back to mine if that's okay. Happy to do so if you want me to go ahead. And just <laughs> yeah, let me let me get out of mine. I am so sorry. Okay. And end Not mine, a problem. You take it so I can drink some water and get a cough drop. <laughs> Not a problem. All right. <clears throat> um, to start with, I just want to emphasize that, uh, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank the committee and thank everyone uh, for the invitation to attend and thank all of you for attending. Um, I just want to emphasize that this presentation uh, is an example of a work in progress. These are our experiences with this journey to seek forgiveness. <clears throat> we share this in hopes that other dioceses and congregations can move together to create a more truthful and comprehensive telling of the experience of the enslaved Catholic faithful and those enslaved by the Catholic faithful. So to begin with, <clears throat> I'd like to read from one of our own financial registers here at the Archdiocese. This is the ledger of Bishop Joseph Rosati, Bishop of the Diocese of St. Louis. This particular entry is uh, from March of 1832. Pay John Durst, carpenter, on account of the building of the new cathedral church with a check on the bank, $300. Paid Monsieur Rondeau for six candlesticks at $50, for a framed carton de tell at $7, and lent him for his journey to France $200, all on, for all, on all for which credit the bank, $257. Paid Hugh O'Neill for the hospital on account with a check on the bank, $200. Stole to the Reverend John Bouillet, my Negro boy called Peter, about nine or 10 years old, for the sum of $150, for which I have received a note of $50 payable in four months in cash, $100 deposited in the bank. So this then is our experience with the Forgive Us Our Trespasses project. To begin with, uh, our previous understandings of slavery and enslaved persons within the diocese was rather sparse, mainly centering on the farms associated with St. Mary's of the St. Mary of the Barron Seminary in Perry County, and the work of the Reverend Stafford Poole and the Reverend Cyprian Davis. In the mid to, uh, 20 teens, we began, began cooperation with other congregations, such as the Society of the Sacred Heart and the Slavery, History, Memory, and Reconciliation Project of the Society of Jesus. In those cooperations and within our own research, we began to discover that diocesan involvement in the slave trade was much more extensive than previously known. In the fall of 2018, I presented those findings to then Archbishop Carl, Robert Carlson, and he agreed that we needed to explore this much more in depth. <laughs> our initial efforts included a team of myself, our volunteer, Emery Weber, who reads and writes fluently in French and had previously assisted the Religious of the Sacred Heart with their Enslaved Persons History Project, and our archivist, Rena Shurgan, who added this project to her already full workload and her research and writing skills are second to none. Our method at this time was to review correspondence in the bishop's files in our own internal collections, and <clears throat> we would present those in regular reports to the archbishop. So this is one of those early documents. <clears throat> this is a concordant between the Reverend Charles Neal, Jesuit speaker for North America, and Bishop Louis de Berg, dated March of, of uh, 1823. It's celebrated here in St. Louis as one of the founding documents for St. Louis University. This is basically the document that handed over responsibility for St. Louis College to the Jesuits. But in this very same document, it provides uh, Bishop uh, Louis, uh, Louis de Berg's permission for the Jesuits to bring six enslaved persons to St. Louis to work their mission farm in Florissant, Missouri. In the fall of 2020, 
Archbishop Mitchell Rosansky was installed and we met with him to discuss our project. He provided a new direction and immediately saw the importance and consequence of this project. Under his direction, we continue to develop and expand the research where possible. We continue to assist other religious communities with their research efforts. And we're always considering ways to communicate our findings with the faithful. We created a new structure, which we'll discuss, and he gave us our new name, Forgive Us Our Trespasses. And finally, he created a steady budget line authorizing funding for the project. Our new objective then was to promote open and honest access to the historic record to achieve a more comprehensive and truthful telling of enslavement within the local Catholic church. Additionally, we promote active community engagement and seek dialogue on the many legacies of slavery in the local community. We share our resources and findings with other congregations and dioceses to provide a more comprehensive and accurate account of slavery within the Catholic Church in the United States. Our new structure then includes an executive committee that meets quarterly, considers new findings, discusses mess messaging and outreach activities, and then provides resources for those efforts. Our research committee discusses findings, discusses st strategy for new research directions, assigns tasks to research committee members, and targets new collections. And finally, our outreach committee discusses and creates new programs, discusses and creates messaging, finds resources for those for that programming, and then returns to discuss effectiveness for that programming that's been created. This is an image of our uh, one of our research committee meetings. We're all hard at work. These are some of the collections which we've uh, um, researched in our in our efforts. Uh, and I should say that Archbishop Rosansky has provided a letter of introduction for our research team that describes what we are doing, why are we are asking for the materials, and showing his support for those requests. These are all the different records types which we have used in our research, and all of these different record types have produced results. And then the following slides are going to show some examples of the records types utilized and how they've come together to form a more complete understanding of that particular enslaved person. This is a letter from the Reverend Edmund Saulnier, traveling by the steamship Oregon to St. Genevieve. He's writing to Bishop Joseph Rosati on Christmas Eve. Saulnier had served the diocese in many ways, including as chancellor and as president of the St. Louis College. This particular passage at the top reads, that same evening, Mr. Van Laughlin, who was to rejoin Monsignor Dana Kerr, came, came on board. The Negro of whom you spoke did not show up. Mr. Van Loeffler told me he was on a farm two miles lower, lower down, but he did not come on board. So since this had a reference to an enslaved person, we immediately flagged it and pursued further research. In this research, we were able to find the following correspondence string. October 25th, 1831, letter from Leon Raymond de Nacaire, Bishop of New Orleans to Joseph Rosati, Bishop of St. Louis. De La Croix has heard that you wish to sell little Andrew, and he would take him. On November 29th, 1831, Bishop Rosati writes to Father de La, Charles de La Croix, pastor of St. Michael Church in Convent, Louisiana. I accept the offer that you have made to buy my little Negro Andrew for $200. I'm sending him with this letter on the steamship Oregon. January 7th, 1832, Bishop Rosati to Father de La Croix. The little Negro Andrew, who uh, should have left on the Oregon, reached the river too late. The steamship had already passed him by. Father de la Croix had yet to send the agreed upon amount of 200. On November 15th, 1832, Bishop Rosati writes to Father de la Croix, I cannot wait years for the little Negro. Bishop de Necker tells you that I am counting on this money. $200 would complete the payment for Andrew. The transaction is completed. Andrew is sold and sent to Nagadosh, Louisiana. A follow-up letter dated March, 18, March 16, 1835, from Father Edrim de Hall to Antoine Blanc, Bishop of New Orleans, reads, 
I am sending Andrew, the little Negro, with Mr. George, after having told the boy that you would allow him to rejoin his mother if you were pleased with him. Andrew was the son of Harry and Jenny, enslaved by Bishop Louis de Berg. He was born into slavery on February 15, 1822, and baptized on March 16, 1823, at St. Ferdinand Church in Florissant, Missouri. Two years after his birth, Bishop de Berg sold Harry's family to Bishop Rosati. By 1835, Andrew would have been 13 years old. He likely did not know that his mother, Jenny, died in 1829. This is back to a financial ledger of Bishop Joseph Rosati. This is an entry dated April 18th, 1834. It reads, bought of, the, uh, bought of Mr. Louis Menard, a Negro woman with her child. The woman is called a spacier for the sum of $500, of which 250 I have paid today and for the balance given my note at 12 months with interest of 6%. There's the entry there. This is an, uh, a transcript of a freedom suit from the Missouri State Courts. The freedom statute was created in Louisiana Territory in 1807 and reinforced by Missouri state law in 1824. It stated that any person held in bondage could petition local courts for permission to sue their enslaver for freedom. The petition had to have legal basis on one of three legs, one, that the enslaved person had been emancipated and had papers and witnesses to prove it. Or two, that they had descended in the maternal line from a free woman of color. Or three, that they had lived or worked in a free state or territory. Freedom, freedom suits were unfortunately made unconstitutional by the Dred Scott decision in 1852. 300 enslaved persons used these freedom statutes to sue to be released from slavery. Less than half were successful. Aspasia sued Bishop Joseph Rosati in 1837 on the basis that her mother, Judy, had lived in the Northwest Territory for two years. The Northwest Territory at the time was a free territory. Rosati sold Aspasia to Hardage Lane rather than fight the lawsuit. He then successfully sued Lane for her freedom in 1839. Finally, this is the 1850 U.S. Census slave schedule, and in it we find three enslaved persons in the household of Archbishop Peter Richard Kenrick. This was actually the first evidence that we had found that Peter uh, Archbishop Kenrick had owned enslaved persons. What are our findings then? To date, we find that all three of the first ordinaries in St. In Louis enslaved persons. Louis William Valentine Duberg, Bishop of Louisiana and the Floridas, we find 28 identified enslaved persons. And I should say that uh, anytime we find a unique identifier, whether that be a name or a scrap of a name, or even someone identified as by their relationship, for example, child of, we mark that and note that and uh, place that on our list of names. Bishop Joseph Rosati, Bishop of St. Louis, we have found to date 19 identified enslaved persons. Peter Richard Kenrick, Archbishop of St. Louis, we have identified four enslaved persons. Additionally, priests operating in the administering the territories of the, of the diocese, we have found 36 identified enslaved persons. Our total then to date is 87 identified enslaved persons. Enslaved persons. And then in addition to that, we found a number of references to unidentified enslaved persons, which we are still researching to this day. Anytime we come across a new name of an enslaved person, we make a note of it and document the reference and the collection in which it appears. When we have enough information and references to document an identified enslaved person, we add that to our historical narrative and provide the references. Our goal is to publish this narrative this spring in conjunction with our Mayafa prayer service. Our goal also is not only to examine the breadth, but the length in which slavery affected the enslaved through generations in time. 
Harry and Ginny and their children are well documented, enough so that we are able to build a timeline of their lives as enslaved persons of the bishops of the diocese. Our outreach committee produces talk, uh, talking points from our research, which we've also used in interviews and articles, including the St. Louis Review, our, our archdiocesan newspaper, KWMU, our local St. Louis public radio station, Catholic St. Louis, which is our local archdiocesan news magazine, and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Our largest project to date has been the uh, prayer service and Ma'afa pr uh, uh, procession. Ma'afa is Kiswahili for great disaster. The tradition, a traditional procession to remember those lives lost in the middle passage of the Atlantic slave trade. Our particular instance of the Ma'afa is an interfaith prayer service held at the old cathedral uh, next to the Mississippi River. Uh, in addition to that, we have a Mayafa procession to the arch grounds where we read the names of the enslaved persons and remember them on the uh, arch, uh, the enslaved persons here on the archdiocese and remember them. It's held every Juneteenth weekend. This is the uh, program from the initial uh, Mayafa prayer service and procession. This is the prayer service at the uh, old cathedral. This is the procession to the arch. And this is Archbishop Rosansky laying carnations in memory of those enslaved by the archdiocese. Our future plans include an online, a robust online presence in conjunction with the Office of Racial Harmony. Keep the community informed on our latest findings and outreach efforts and to build a, content, a digital content library including those documents which we have used to document enslaved persons within the archdiocese. We will continue community engagement and obviously continue our collabor collaboration with CROSS, which Dr. Loomis has been speaking on. As we've gone through this project and continue to go through this project, the biggest question I get is why? Why now? Why do this? And I've heard it all. Why bring this up now? It was in the past. It's history. It's Catholic slavery. Catholic slavery was a kinder, gentler version of slavery. It's all, it's all there. <clears throat> the USCCB pastoral letter opened wide our hearts. The enduring call to love teaches that racism in all its forms is an evil in society. Furthermore, an act based in, in the evil of racism is a sinful act. Of the church, St. John Paul II noted that although she is holy because of her incorporation into Christ, the church does not tire of doing penance. Before God and man, he always acknowledges as her own her sinful sons and daughters. These are hard conversations, but we must have them because they are hard. In order to be fully penitent and reconcile ourselves before God, we have to be truth, open, and honest about our sins now and in the past. Only then can we truly seek forgiveness. From open wide our hearts, we, the Catholic bishops in the United States, acknowledge the many times which the church has failed to live as Christ taught, to love our brothers and sisters. Acts of racism have been committed by leaders and members of the Catholic Church, by bishops, clergy, religious, and laity, and her institutions. We express deep sorrow and regret for them. We also acknowledge those instances which we have not, and when we have not act, we have not done enough or stood by silently when grave acts of injustice were committed. We ask for forgiveness from all who have been harmed by these sins committed in the past or in the present. Here in St. Louis, we celebrate the names and stories of the Catholic faithful, Duberg, Rosati, Duchesne, Dodo, these are all names familiar to us. And now it is time to add new names to this list. Harry, Espacia, Andrew, and that young man named Peter. Thank you. Yes, let's mm -hmm. hope that I can um, continue. <laughs>
Thank you, everybody, for um, for sticking with us. And I am I really apologize um, for that coughing fit. I think that's the first time in 25 years of my speaking that that's ever happened. Um, I was here with transparency, and this is when Eric was talking about cross and the collaboration of cross. The third pit leg of that um, truth access is transparency. Archbishop Shelton Fobb has spoken eloquently about reconciliation in the church and what that means for those who suffer from racism and those whose ancestors were enslaved. We need to recognize that these records contain vital information for those researching their past. We need to recognize that these records may be the only place where someone's name is noted. Researching in these records is of utmost importance to those whose ancestors were enslaved. It is the community of today that we serve. And it is those communities that need access to this information. In being open and transparent, we also have the ability to evangelize and that in itself can also be powerful. Sacramental records are among the most important resources available to scholars researching the lives of enslaved and free persons of color. In many dioceses, these records are extensive, well-maintained, and searchable. They document baptisms, confirmations, marriages, and burials. Because these records detail the life history of the local community over time, church officials recognize them as having unique and enduring value. More importantly, they illustrate the Catholic heritage of families that are passed from one generation to the other. In order to truly appreciate what is in the record, one must be familiar with the laws, traditions, and practices used in the registers prior to the 1865 year of emancipation. Well, emancipation happened two years before. Manumissions, surnames, recognized paternity, and evidence of literacy are examples of important social evidence found in these archival records. If you're interested, there is a newly published book, The Catholic Church and Slavery, where my essay, and you see the title here, on the subject was published. Um, it talks about all the laws and what was happening with the laws and how we see those within the Catholic Church records themselves. But now for some examples, because as, um, as we all know, a picture is worth a thousand words, and it does tell a story, as so eloquently Eric has pointed out um, with his case study. Hey, Leap, go ahead and share your slides. Oh, I thought I was... No, we're just looking at you. <laughs> oh, that is... You know, this is... Uh, 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 let's see. Thank you. <laughs> I hit the slide button before. All right, let's see. All right, we have a slide now. You got it. If they could go, if it could go wrong, you know, today is the day. <laughs> Which is just amazing. Anyway, so let's talk about Philippe. Um, this, is, this is a great example. Um, Philippe is standing as a godfather for a young child who is also named Philippe. The record is written in French. The 27th of August, 1757, I, the undersigned, supplied the ceremonies of baptism, having been baptized simply at home, to Philippe Negrillon, slave of Sir Dupart, born about a month ago to Rose Negres, slave of the same and father unknown. The godfather Philippe Negre, slave of the Capuchin missionaries, and godmother Elizabeth Negres, slave of the same Sir Dupart. In faith I sign Father Irony Capuchin. But what is this record also shows us is that Philippe, the godfather, could sign his name. Notice the scratch out and blotted area on the bottom of the page of the left side. This is evidence that Philippe attempted twice to sign his name. P, H, scratch out, P, H, scratch out again. Eventually, Philippe is written on the page. Philippe, 
and caps enslaved by the Capuchin missionaries learned to write his name. This next entry is an example of a child who is freed at baptism. This is a little known fact, but priest in Louisiana with permission from the enslaver could baptize a child free. Marie Alexandrina was baptized free in 1828. Her enslaver, Manette Roberson, gives permission and her father, Raymond Munn, acknowledges her. This is an intricate entry that provides a wealth of information that can be found nowhere else. And besides it being complicated, it's also in two different languages. So it's in French and it's in Spanish. Here is another example um, of, of a note in an entry that carries weight of freedom, but at a future time. On the 20th of March, 1829, was baptized Joseph William Quarteron, born the 23rd of December, natural child of Rebecca, Moulatres, slave of Wolkoff, residents of this parish, who desires to make free the baptized in accordance with the attached declaration. The godfather is Mr. Joseph Force Field, and the godmother is Louise Safiz, and El Monet is the pastor. What is attached to the baptism is a, is a memo from Mr. Woolfork to his lawyer, Mr. Field, who was also the godfather of the child. Sir, it is my wish that the boy child of Becky should be free at the age of 21, as I think it too white to be a slave for life. Respectfully, Woolfork, New Orleans, March 19th, 1827. This might be a familiar face to some of you. This is the baptism of Augustine, who becomes Augustus Tolton, the first black priest in the United States. On the 29th of May, I, the undersigned, baptized Augustine, a colored child, born the 1st of April, the property of Stephen Elliott, sponsor Mrs. Stephen Elliott. Joseph O'Sullivan is the priest. Augustine's mother is, Mary, is Martha Jane, and she was born in Missouri in a small town called Rodelia. And I could certainly go on a lot about her. I'm actually currently writing her biography, but we'll um, have a little bit more about her in some of the other, in one other slide. I'm gonna now look at some marriages and what we see in the marriages. This is the marriage of an enslaved person to a free person of color. Henriette DeLille, whose cause for canonization is at the Vatican, is standing as witness. She signs her name to the register. This is the one of, one of the few examples that we have of her signature. But what it also shows us is, is that she was ministering to both enslaved and free, and that they too were allowed to marry, even though one was enslaved and one was free. The enslaver, who is um, Leon Valente, um, had to sign um, allowing his enslaved person to marry a free person of color. Sacramental marriages amongst enslaved people are found far less in the registers. This is because the enslaver had to give permission and pay fees associated with the marriage. But many religious organizations require this enslaved people to be married and they were exempt from paying the fees. This is the marriage of Theodore and Rosalie that took place in 1849. Theodore and Rosalie are owned by a religious community in New Orleans. But take note of the eight entries below the marriage. These are marks of enslaved people attending and witnessing the marriage. They are related to Theodore and Rosalie as siblings, parents, cousins, and others. Each one made their mark in the record. And this is truly an example of a community celebrating a marriage. In 1858, Theodore married Augustine because Rosalie had died. Again, we see the same marks in those who, of those who celebrated as a community at the marriage of Theodore and Augustine. Other records held at the religious order indicate that Theodore had left on the 2nd of August, 1863 to quote, 
claim his freedom before the federal authorities of New Orleans, unquote. Several days later, two of Theodore's children joined him. And without this information, we would not know Theodore's story. It is within the religious community's records that Theodore's story comes to life and that we know more about him. But not only do we see baptisms and marriages, we also see first communions, we see confirmations of those that are enslaved. We see them um, being allowed to join arch confraternities and prayer groups that were probably going with their enslavers, but they participated and they were also allowed to join. Burials of enslaved people go um, very far back, especially in Louisiana, because under the Code Noir, you not only had to baptize um, your enslaved people, it was law, under colonial law, um, but you also had to bury them in sacred ground. So we have entries for those that were enslaved in the Catholic records at the Archdiocese of New Orleans that have those burials. What we also see, and this is um, quite unusual, is, um, and this happened, this is actually in Kentucky, in Rodelia, where I talked earlier about Augustine's mother, Matil um, Martha. This is a headstone for Martha's mother, so Augustus Tolton's grandmother, um, and she is enslaved, and it says, in memory of Matilde, her name was Matilda, um, consort, wife, of Gustin Chisley, born 18, and it should be 06, the zero is missing, and she died April 2nd, 1836, at the age of um, 30. Um, behind her, the very ornate uh, headstone is that of her enslaver. What is interesting also about this story is that Gustin Chisley, who was Augustus Tolton's grandfather, uh, married a second time, to a woman named Maria, who also has a headstone in this um, section of the White Cemetery. So um, the family were participants in the church and had headstones. What we also see sometimes is commemoration of the cemetery um, by putting up crosses. <coughs> Here I go again. Excuse me. And the crosses are to note where the enslaved were buried. These are um, a way of commemorating the enslaved who had no headstones. What I want to end with is the thought of the power of these records. Not and, and the power comes in two areas. One is the power that the church has and the dioceses and the communities have. Um, of holding on to these records and not opening them up. That is a power the church doesn't want to have or shouldn't want to have. The power of the record for the community that needs these records um, enlightens them into being able to search their history. If we don't allow that power to go from the church to the community of descendants, then we are not doing what we need to do as the faithful in helping with reconciliation and healing. There are a lot um, is there is a lot to explore in this area. There's a lot that the new organization Cross is doing. We had our first um, conference in October of last year, where descendants, where scholars, where archivists, and where bishops and priests came. Um, to work with us. We now have best, a best practices manual and we are continuing to move this work forward. Um, I'm gonna stop here so that we can take any questions or comments if anyone has them. I do have my contact information here if anyone wants to get in touch with me. And certainly if there are questions for Eric, um, I can pass them along. Um, it, with his contact information if there's something that anybody wants to know from us. And I will turn this back over to you, Sarah, so I can stop coughing. <laughs> well, thank you so much, um, Lee and Eric. We do have a couple questions and I do encourage anyone um, who has a question for either panelists to go ahead and put it in um, the Q&A so we can have those read and shared. So 
One that we got kind of earlier in the presentation, Eric, for you is, um, do you know if Washington University has also kind of undertaken any effort as far as looking towards records of enslavement, I guess, maybe regarding their founding or early years? Uh, yeah, they have. Um, they've, they're both looking into their founders and their early board. Uh, if you do a web search on uh, WashU and slavery, you can find their website landing page. Um, can you, sh Eric, can you show your objective slide again? Oh, mm -hmm. That might be And a then while you pull see. that up, um, <laughs> we had a question of, can you share your best practices manual? Was that something that's sort of yeah, widely actually, available? The best, yeah, the best practices manual, I, I'm going to say, I think it's online under the ACDA, the Association of Catholic Diocesan Archivist. Um, there is a landing page on that website that we've used um, and it talks about cross. So it has the mission, it has the purpose. And my, and I do believe that it also has the manual as well. Um, the manual, the, the intent of the manual is not only to help archivists, but it's also to help bishops and other church leaders um, and community leaders have, have, have a background. So you know, a, a bishop walks out of church and someone says, hey, I just saw on PBS about the Georgetown 272 being in, uh, being sold by the Jesuits down the river to um, to Louisiana. What do you think of that? Well, we want them to be able to say, you know, we know um, we, we are aware of this and give them some talking points um, just so that they not necessarily, and I don't mean it in a public way or PR way for, for, for talking points, but so that they know and are aware that this is coming up and it's out in the world um, and that we need to address it and be better prepared. Um, we talk about where you can find information, what, how you can research to, in your own collections to be able to make this available. We're hoping to help archivists work with their leadership as well as work with the descendants. Um, Eric, is there anything I'm missing out of that manual? No, I, I think that's, uh, let me make sure I'm unmuted here. Yep. Oh, uh, no, Lee. Uh, oh, oh sorry, ahead. Lee, if you stop sharing, then Eric can share. He can oh, pull up that, that slide. Oh, yeah. People had asked. Get rid of it. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, yeah, the, the, the ultimate goal of that best practices manual was, was to help anyone, you know, any diocese or, or congregations or, or frankly, anyone of that holds religious uh, collections and knows that within those collections, there's documentation of enslaved persons and potentially documentation that their own particular congregation or diocese were enslavers. And then where do you go from that? And what do you do next? Uh, um, okay, I mean, me I know see. that cross is kind of particularly for the Catholic faith. Do you guys know of any other um, organized religions that are kind of going into this, any of the Protestant faiths? I don't know what type of records they would have held. Um, so that, that would be something. I know the Episcopal Church may have records of enslaved people being baptized. I don't know about the Protestant communities. Yeah, I, I, mean, do know like... that there were, I do know that there were Protestant ministers um, that held enslaved people, certainly. Um, the, well, you know, one of the ways you can do some of that is to go through the records, um, the census records. While you won't get individual names, you will get in the 1850s and 1860s the name of a person and the number of um of people they enslaved with their sex noted and usually their age, but no names. Um, are either of you looking to use this information to address current issues of racism um, in the church? Um, so I have been invited twice and I will be going a third time to um, speak with the bishops that are on the Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism, which is part of the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops that meet every year. I have spoken with them twice, um, and, and we are part of um, 
they have been active in helping us as we've launched Cross um, and have been partnering with us. So in that respect, yes, we are working with them because if we don't look at our past, we can't move forward. And and it's rooted in, in this past. Yeah, I mean, Eric, and you had talked about there's quite a, a lot of outreach that you're um, that you guys are doing in Missouri. Um, we had a question kind of more specifically about, uh, you know, diocesan and archdiocesan records in general. Um, like, you know, for Missouri and the archdiocese, is it just St. Louis or are you guys looking into some of the other counties kind of nearby? In Missouri? Of, yeah, um, I mean, I guess it's sort of a general question about like it, the archdiocese of New Orleans, you know, encompasses so many, you know, civil parishes, same with archdiocese of St. Louis. So I guess if people are looking for uh, maybe churches in the region, but not in the city, like how would they best find out about you know, yeah, so let me, I can give you a little known fact that most people kind of haven't, fit, well, you know, you got a family search and it's surprising the amount of Catholic church records that are on family search that nobody knows it's there because they're not indexed. So you have to go in right. different way to find them. So for instance, if you are Archdiocese of Chicago will not have uh, really uh, enslavement records because Illinois was not a slave state. Missouri will. So as I've been working on uh, Martha Tolton, Augustus Tolton's mother, I have crawled all over Missouri records and have found a tremendous amount. I have done the same thing in um, in uh, in Kentucky um, and have had access to their records. Um, you just have to kind of be able to know how to get into the back end of that. There are the Diocese of um, Alexandria in Louisiana now has their records online. Um, it's, it's, it's a hunt and peck to figure out where they are in the back. What I have found the easiest way to do is to go through a Google search of Catholic Church records, Missouri, and then put family search. It'll take you to a family search page that will link everything down and you'll get civil records as well as church records and how to get to them. Don't go to the um, to the to the index, although you can like Springfield's index, but don't go to the index. Go to the images and then it'll list the churches. And then through that, you can pick the church and go through the register. There's a long explanation, but that's the easiest way to do it. <laughs> Convoluted, but it, it, it's possible. So we had a question, I guess, more specifically related to Cross, where Lee, you're doing research kind of in New Orleans and Eric, you're doing St. Louis. People are asking if this is sort of a nationwide effort, if you guys have um, participants from other dioceses, maybe up in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic. Eric, you wanna talk about who else is on this with us? So, sure, um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, uh, for those unfamiliar with the Catholic Church, uh, especially, you know, the diocesan level Catholic Church, most of these decisions are made at the diocesan level. So each individual diocese within the United States has its own diocesan archives. Um, so what our attempt to do with CROSS is to try and coordinate as best we possibly can and bring as many of those dioceses together as we possibly can uh, to share our information, to share those best practices, and try and get us to move together with one, one voice uh, <laughs> when we're telling the story of enslavement. Um, <clears throat> So in actuality, our founding members and our 16, is it 16? We have to 16 now? Mm -hmm. uh, 16 board members. It, it really is across the United States. We uh, have members all the way from the Archdiocese of Boston, all the way down to New Orleans. Um, at our um, initial conference, we had members coast to coast uh, arrive and uh, show up for that conference. Yeah, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, South Carolina. California. New Orleans, New California. Yeah, we... Yeah, but we have those board members too um, yep. that are there. So it's it's also getting it, it does get attention at the Association of Catholic Diocese and Archivist as well. So um, you know, enslavement prior to uh, prior to some laws in the states was across the United States, and our mission also is to make sure that even if a, a bishop would say, "Well, our diocese doesn't." didn't have enslaved people. Well, 
it, it may not have, but it was. You were affected by it. You were affected by it. Um, and and that bishop may end up being moved someplace else or take, you know, being elevated to another archdiocese or something. And that 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 diocese may. And so we want to make sure that everybody gets it. I mean, um, yeah, New York, Boston, they all did. I think we have time for one more. Um, this is one that we got in the beginning, but it said, um, pardon me, there's a, a train going by, it's loud. Uh, it says, regarding offensive language, in your professional opinions, should offensive language in old documents be changed in a finding aid, or would that do more harm? But does changing it make it the opposite of transparency or erasing the harmful past? You know, um, uh, it, yes and no. So I, I am one for leaving, the language is what the language is um, in the record, so we cannot change the record. The finding aid is something different. However, if so, I'll, I'll go just in the 50s, the 1950s in the United States, um, they're, they're, the Catholic Church would put out things that would have the Negro and Indian Mission Society, which was a great philanthropic work that um, many people were associated with. Well, if you change that title, then how do you find it when you're searching, especially now when so many things are word searchable? Um, if you look at the Native Americans, like the Inuits, and what's happening in Canada, and there are others that can talk also about this more so, is that, yes, there was Alaskan, or yes, there were the, 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 the terms, the Eskimo term, is offensive today and it's not a term you want there. So they are now leaving that term and sometimes putting it bracketed and then putting Inuit in the in the finding aid, but not getting rid of the original language because that also needs to be researched. It's also as we're beginning to change with using the word slave and enslaved. Um, if you go back 10 years ago, when you see anybody's writing, including mine, you'll see the word slave and master because we were not using those words yet of enslave and enslaver. So it, it's, it's, it moves as we move in language. Yeah. And I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say, I would agree with that when we are writing our descriptions for finding needs, we will not use that harm, harmful language in those descriptions. But if we're providing direct transcriptions of those documents, we use the the language of the enslavers. I mean, we will we will provide a warning that you know this is the language of the enslavers and it can be harmful. But um, we feel that the language is what it is and it should be presented as it was. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank both of you so much, Lee and Eric, for participating today. And I want to let everybody know who's still on that um, our next lunch and learn is um, ancestry digitization program which is on Thursday, March 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern. And then the next archival chat is going to be community archiving with Madonna House. And that's on April 18th at 3 p.m. So thank you guys for presenting. And I just wanna thank everyone for attending. And this is all recorded and can be available for viewing on our YouTube channel. So, and don't forget to fill out the survey at the end. So thank you everyone. Thank you.